Back in 1981, I had the American dream, the beautiful wife, the house in the suburbs, and a beautiful six-year-old son. And one day I went to work, kissed my son goodbye, and never saw him again. In two weeks, I became the parent of a murdered child, and I'll always be the parent of a murdered child. I still have the heartache. I still have the rage. I waited years for justice. I know what it's like to be there waiting for some answers. And over those years, I learned how to do one thing really well, and that's how to catch these bastards and bring them back to justice. I become a manhunter. I'm out there looking for bad guys. The story appears to have been invented by Hollywood. Many of the cops that were involved said this can't be true. It is too bizarre, too twisted. They thought this is some type of drug-induced fantasy by these prostitutes. But this really happened. You know, the story was kind of hard to believe. It was kind of a crazy story, kind of far out. Uh, I have heard of things like that happening, but I hadn't experienced it and it hadn't been here in Portland. I was a career cop in Portland. Worked vice for five years, prostitution detail. The prostitution problem was really gigantic at that time. I really got involved in it. I got to know a number of the girls. I wanted to be to where on a daily basis, like I walk up to the working girls and talk with them, have a conversation, tell them to move on. But you know, if I catch you, you're gonna go to jail. But if you need any help, uh, you let me know. Michelle was a lady that would work the area from Holman and MLK northbound down to Columbia Boulevard. I was living a different lifestyle at that time. I was a prostitute, I was feeding my drug addiction, and I was walking the streets and selling my body to pay for my addiction. One day, I went to work and I saw her, and she came out and told me a story. Um. It was a night like any other night. I went out as I normally would. I would walk the street, it wouldn't take long. He was tall. Just looked unusual. Un unsavory and unlikable, unlovable. We made the agreement. It was an agreement for $30 for a car day. And then it went really wrong.
there was another individual. They take me around to the back of the truck. The bed of the truck was ready. Prostitutes are an easy target for predators. Usually lots of them are runaways. Nobody's gonna look for them. Predators know that. The other one was younger and more full body. When the car stopped, I'm thinking I'm gonna die. I'm chained to the bed. I was repeatedly raped. So many people can't wrap their heads around the fact that sex, even if you're a prostitute, is voluntary. It's consenting adults having sex for money. Someone kidnapping a prostitute and raping them repeatedly is rape. I was so physically ravaged. There's no words to describe the terror. I thought it was a sick head game. Why would they spare my life? That morning, the taller, older individual that I had originally made the car date with walked me into the closet. Can you imagine being locked in a closet in the dark after being tortured, brutalized, raped, sodomized? This is a drug-addicted prostitute, but she's still a daughter, she's still a sister. Michelle always talked to mom every day, and I believe it had been more than a day, pushing 48 hours or so, when my mother called me and said, hey, I, I think something's wrong. We knew that she was working herself on the streets. No one wants to see your sister doing that. We went out to some of the known areas where prostitutes might be. We just couldn't find my little sister. Just a, a cycle. So I'm just going by daylight and then no daylight to kind of gauge my days. It was just more torture, more terror. consummate predators. They were so evil and so skilled in their attempts to break this person down. These guys were pros. 
need to Polaroid pictures of me. If I didn't do what I was instructed to do, I was sexually tortured later. I was punished by penetration of foreign objects. There was a homemade electrocution device that was used on me. At this point, my soul was broke. They had broke my soul. And then, I don't know how many days later, the younger individual told me that I would be let loose, that he would not kill me. I thought it was a sick head game. Why would they spare my life? I was put in the front of the vehicle. We drove for approximately a half an hour. And then the door was opened up, the hood was pulled off, and I was pushed out of the vehicle. I arrived at my mom's home. She locks the door behind me. We call the police and we proceed on to Emanuel Hospital in Portland, Oregon. The detectives at the hospital wrote down everything that I said. I was a known prostitute feeding my drug addiction. So I really couldn't expect them to believe me, but I did move forward with filing the report and the right kit. She certainly didn't know where she had been um, brutalized. She didn't know what city. She didn't know the, the identity of the, of the assailants. The police didn't have enough to even, even launch a detailed investigation, and the report was filed away, and um, nothing else happened. I was working uh, my patrol, and Michelle came up to me, and she proceeded to tell me about all the things that uh, she had experienced in the last week. You know, I, I had to think about that for an awful lot, because the story was something that is hard to believe. Two years later, in 1990, I was contacted by a Washington County detective. And he told me about a lady. She had been kidnapped, tied up, raped, put in chains, who escaped. So it's happened again. Before I knew what was even happening, I was in the back of the truck with a pillowcase on my head and duct tape on my mouth. At 11.30 at night, I was working as a patrol officer on the night shift, and I received a call of a kidnapping assault that had occurred at uh, the area of 37th and Olympic here in Hillsborough. When I arrived on the scene, I saw a young lady who was covered with cuts and bleeding. She told me that she'd been kidnapped from Portland. She wasn't even sure what city she was in. She asked me several times where we were, and I had to tell her we were in the city of Hillsboro, outside of Portland. In 1990, I had just turned 17. I typically would wake up and go work the streets to get enough money to buy drugs to last me 
try, I would try to get enough money to make it last all day. It was pretty early in the morning, like two or three in the morning. A little pickup truck pulled over before I knew what was even happening. I was in the back of the truck, chained to the bed of the truck, and with a pillowcase on my head and duct tape on my mouth. I was so terrified. I just remember the guy that was in the back with me telling the other guy that if he wanted to turn, to let him know, and they could pull over and they could switch. They left the pillowcase on all night. It was just one rape after another. It was constant. He said, don't bother screaming because nobody's going to hear you. My mind was just, oh, I'm done, like this is it. I took the pillowcase off. I was terrified all over again. There's a bars on the windows. What is this place? There were weapons lying around, guns. They had all the tools, all the things they needed to do that kidnapping. They were so well rehearsed. They are remorseless, violent, dangerous sociopaths. They tried to make me read literature about some servant women. I couldn't do it. I was just too hysterical for a while. At one point when he was leading me back from the bathroom, I saw a window that had no bars on it. That was my first bit of hope, like, oh, I can maybe get out. Then at one point, I saw them going in and out of the closet with big foam squares. I could hear them in there, hanging up the soundproofing. At that point, I just knew that if I ever got in that closet, I might not ever be seen or heard from again. I told him, you won, I'll read your book, and I'll learn to be a good girl. I'll learn to be how you want me to be. I let one of my hands out of the chains so that I could turn the pages. I was able to unbuckle my legs, but my other hand was still chained. up a gun and ran right across the hall, but they heard me. And they were right behind me. One of the guys was yelling, get her, get her, she can't get away. Most of the people that have viewed the videotape of the inside of the house report that it makes the hair on the back of their neck stand up. right behind me. One of the guys was yelling, get her, get her, she can't get away. I ran down the street, hysterically crying and bleeding all over. 
I was scared that they were literally right behind me. Here's a vulnerable 17-year-old girl that was smart enough, tough enough, had the presence of mind to say, I'm going to stay alive, I'm going to look for that chance, and that's what saved her life. That's a pretty courageous and brave 17-year-old girl. Because of the nature of her injury, she needed to get to a hospital for medical treatments. While she was being treated and stitched up, my sergeant and I started taking photographs of her wounds and getting a brief statement of what had occurred. At about five in the morning, when we were all finished with the interviews and the medical treatment, we drove her to the location to point out the house where she believes uh, she had been held at. We drove around and drove around and drove around for a while. It was very difficult for me because when I ran out of the house, I never looked back. And finally, I saw the curtains coming out of the window. We haven't located the suspects and there's still been no movement at this house. But the rifle that she used to break out the window is still laying outside on the ground. For us, this was fantastic evidence and to corroborate this crazy story she's telling us. Detectives have now been pursuing a search warrant so that we can go into that house and locate specific items that she's told us about to help document and verify her side of the story. While they were conducting surveillance, um, waiting the arrival of the search warrant, police officers observed the white Datsun pickup truck uh, come around the corner and pull into the driveway. The first subject that we interview is Vance Roberts. Vance Roberts was the registered owner of the truck and the owner of the house. They were asking where he'd been for the last few hours. Apparently he had cut his arm and they did have a very funny story to tell in my mind that this girl was trying to steal. That's why she jumped out the window and that's how he received his cut. That he had went to a local hospital to receive medical treatment for his arm. After we spoke to him, we decided to interview his brother. Paul Jackson. Jackson states, you know, I was just basically along for the ride. I don't know what happened. I thought he picked up a prostitute. They were having a lot of sex, and I was watching TV in the living room. Completely unbelievable to me. It was very tough not to want to just go throw them in jail right off the bat. But we wanted to make sure we did everything exactly per the letter of the law. They were told that they could not enter into the house before we could get back with a signed warrant. The truck they were driving also was gonna remain on the property. But at the same time, you know, we weren't at the position yet to make that arrest. So they were free to go about their way. They went next door and borrowed one of the neighbor's cars. The surveillance officers followed them down to a local restaurant where they were having dinner. About five, five o'clock or so, I got the warrant signed by the judge, and we immediately served a search warrant on the house. Most of the people that have viewed the videotape of the inside of the house report that it makes the hair on the back of their neck stand up. found windows with bars on the inside. They found a small room with blue soundproofing tiles on the walls. They 
found a photograph of Andrea sitting in a chair with a very defeated look on her face. They found her personal possessions in a Tupperware container, exactly like Andrea had described. Once all that evidence was there, it was very easy for us to say, let's go get him and put him in jail. And that's when the surveillance says, okay, they're at this restaurant having dinner. The officers immediately went in there, put them under arrest. I was surprised. I was shocked. I just couldn't believe it. Uh, it just, just doesn't seem like something either one of them would be involved with. Vance Roberts convinced his family, you know, it was just sex for money, it's okay. We were never hurt anybody, I'd never hurt a girl. They're street trash, they're bottom feeder girls, you know, so what? I didn't find any family member that believed our Vance were guilty. They still don't believe he's guilty. We then found a bunch of other photographs of other women who were probably not in that house of their own free will. Vance Roberts and his half-brother, Paul Jackson, when they took him to the office for formal interviews. The stories they were telling the officers were just so totally bogus. but they were quite close. Paul Jackson, he was living with his parents in Arizona, and he had just come out there to visit Vance at his Hillsboro home. We have two half-brothers that have the same disrespect and anger and hate for women, except their mother. They really are mama's boys. And... They like to degrade women, and they like to do it in a very sadistic way. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you and Paul are together in where? Hillsboro, Portland, Portland. Portland. I saw that girl. And she's a real pretty girl. Anyway, then we talked, and we made arrangements to have sex. Our three of us did it. Queen size beds were about it. Tell me again why uh, your window got broken and what happened. Because a girl jumped out the window. Why would a girl jump out of your window? I have no idea. Anytime she wanted to leave, she could have left, except you know, for the fact that I caught her stealing the money. And she could have just as easily run out the front door. You're aware, of course, we're searching your house at this time with a search warrant. We're finding a lot of items in your house. We then found a bunch of other photographs of other women who were probably not in that house of their own free will. We have some photographs in your house showing people being tied up in bondage. They're old girlfriends. Old girlfriends, yes. Vance Roberts is really a classic. Play the system, arrogant asshole. Who are you going to believe? Me, the homeowner that has a job, Vance Roberts, or that street hooker 
that's twisting her story because she doesn't want to get arrested for prostitution. They knew the game. They were extremely dangerous. The defendants were charged with multiple counts of uh, kidnapping, uh, rape, and sodomy. I don't know anything about the girls that they held at the house. I don't know anything about that. I never saw Paul with the girlfriend, but Vance had quite a few girlfriends. He had a way with women. He could pick them up really easy. He was quite a ladies' man. Bail was set at $80,000, which allowed uh, a person to be released after posting just 10% or $8,000. They were bailed out within a several days by their mom. She had flew out from Arizona. One of the conditions, she had to reside with them and make sure they got to their court appearances. So we knew where they were. Then became the real work of trying to find those other girls. We started looking to Portland for other unsolved abductions, and I reached out to Harry Jackson. Detective Parks says, I understand that you're the person that I need to talk to if I'm trying to locate a possible prostitute. There was one photograph. I looked at it and says, I know this person. That's Michelle. Michelle Dirich. Two years apart, the two guys do the same thing. When she initially told me the story two years ago, I'm saying it was kind of a strange story. Now to find out that it was real, I felt bad. When Bruce Parks told me that another victim had survived, I felt stronger, I felt sane, I felt that maybe I could bring some resolve to this in my life. We then showed her uh, a series of six photographs. She immediately identified Vance Roberts and Paul Jackson. She started actually crying. She was, she says, no one believed me that this had actually happened to me. She was so relieved that somebody finally believed her and the two guys, we finally caught them. From that identification, we immediately drove back out to Hillsboro and put them under arrest again. This time we asked the judge to increase their bail because we knew we found two. We had more pictures to identify. There's other victims out there. We need to find them or at least find out what happened to them. After a hearing before one of our judges, the uh, bail was reduced to a point where the mother could afford to post the 10% and uh, the brothers were let out and remained free pending their trial, which was set for um, early 1991. When the trial was going to start, Vance Roberts and Paul Jackson did not show up to court. The judge issued warrants for their arrest for failure to appear. They are on the run. I guarantee you right now, he is still out there victimizing other women. He's just a monster. He needs to be caught. called me and let me know that uh, these guys had uh, had escaped bail and uh, I, I just couldn't believe the words I was hearing from my mother's mouth that that these guys are out on the loose now it's like what is wrong with their justice system that they can't hold somebody behind bars when they've done something so heinous like this I just couldn't believe that I was really hearing this 
they kept the trophies, the Polaroids of the multiple, multiple girls. How many of those girls didn't make it back to the streets? These two guys may be serial killers and nobody knows it. Neither one of the brothers was seen again for 16 years. In 2006, Vance Roberts uh, walked into the Washington County Jail, said that he thought he had a warrant for his arrest and uh, he wanted to turn himself in. I immediately went down there. I had to see this for myself. First thing I said, where you been for the last 15 years? And he goes, oh, I was living under the bridges in Portland. But his hands, I looked at his fingers. There was no dirt. They weren't weathered. I said, I don't believe you. He would not cooperate, wouldn't tell us where his brother was. He says, I think I want my day in court. Vance Roberts was counting on the fact that uh, we wouldn't be able to put together a, a strong enough criminal case 16 years later. The defense tried to victimize the two women. They may have committed a small crime by working on the street as a prostitute, but they never agreed to be kidnapped. They're still human beings. I felt like I was on trial. The defense attorney basically was saying I'm not a credible witness because I was a prostitute and a drug addict. He was convicted. It was a quick verdict. It doesn't obviously have any remorse whatsoever. On the day of sentencing, I said what I needed to say. You brutalized me, you terrorized me. You left me mentally and emotionally crippled beyond words or expression. It wasn't just me, though. Indeed, there were many other victims, more victims than we may know about today. Everybody knows about the 10 other victims, so I'd like to know where their bodies at. He's now serving a sentence of, I believe, about 108 years in the state penitentiary. He rolled the dice. He lost. After he was convicted, I felt vindicated that he gets to spend the rest of his life in a situation of subservience. He's told when to use the bathroom, when to eat, what he can do, just like they had planned for me, and I was, and I felt like that was just. I publicly forgave him because I have to live with myself <laughs> and my moral compass is huge. And for me to move forward, I had to forgive him. <laughs> I'm saddened, angry, and very surprised that Paul Jackson's been able to stay out there 23 years because he's still doing exactly what he did. Lepers don't change their spots, these type of guys. The other victims still haven't been identified. There are a number of people um, who believe that um, some of these other women um, met with a worse and different fate than uh, Andrea and Michelle. And that's one of the things that investigators um, fear the most. Paul Jackson is still out there victimizing other women. And I don't think he's going to let any of them live to testify against him this time. The biggest thing that, that we're looking for is someone to come forward that they've, maybe this has happened to them and they escaped from it. We'd like to hear from them. They may have a piece of the puzzle to get this creature off the streets. Paul Jackson is, it's just a monster. He, um... He preys upon weak women, and uh, he takes what he wants when he wants it, and he treats them like they're nothing. He needs to be caught.
Paul Jackson has a scar on his stomach from having his appendix removed. Jackson has lived in both Arizona and Hawaii and has a background in electronic and automotive work. If you've seen Paul Jackson or know anything about his whereabouts, please call 1-866-THE-HUNT or go to our website at cnn.com slash the hunt. You can remain anonymous. We'll pass your tip on to the proper authorities and if requested, will not reveal your name. Ben started writing to me just shortly after he got into prison. His letters were 14 pages all the time, and he's never written a word about Paul. Never. Has not written anything. So, I've asked him a couple times. He may be right here in Oregon. Vance always said, if you want to hide from the police, hide in plain sight. They never find you. 